Good evening. We'd like to call this Operations Management Budget and Government Accountability Committee meeting to order for our departmental budget hearings. Our last night uh, for today, it is April 26, 2023, um, and we have the Treasurer's Office that is here to present to us first. Uh, and also tonight, we have our Town and City Clerk's Office, and our last department that's going to be presenting to us is the Registrar of Voters. Uh, so we have um, our City Treasurer, uh, Madam Carmen Sierra, and you may take it away and introduce your wonderful staff that you have with you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Majority Leader, Council President, and Member of the Council. Um, to my right is Shay Eve. She is the Chief Administrator Officer. To my left is Gary Draghi. He's the Chief Investment Officer. Sean Antoine, who's the Project Manager, uh, Investment Manager. And then um, Martin Alvaranga, who's the Deputy Treasurer. So I'd like to start off first, uh, again, saying thank you. And second, explain a little bit what the office does and then get into the accomplishments. The office of our city treasurer is independently elected and the custodians of all city funds. Values and missions, number one, we strive for excellence and integrity. Customer friendly, we listen to our customers, providing the best quality service we can serve as a city fiscal watchdog, which, is, which means safe, smart, and sensible. Teamwork, collaborate with the city administration, the council, businesses, and community leaders. In diversity and inclusion, recruitment of minorities, female vendors, and investment managers. I work hard to protect all city assets, follow prudent investment, cash management, and debt management policy, and best industry practices. I try to relieve the burden on taxpayers and leverage my office uh, to improve the quality of life of the Hartford resident through providing summer youth program, financial literacy outreach, STEM-based collaboration, and investment of taxpayers' dollars to generate interest income that could be used for capital improvement projects. My role and responsibility exists on first, serve as a co-issue of all city bonds, working with the mayor and the chief financial officer, invest the asset of the city pension, which is over one billion, and OPIT trust fund, which is 23 million, manage all city cash, and conduct all banking relations. I work with Liberty Bank, Bank of America, Webster Bank, and TD Bank. Invest and disperse city trust funds. Administer the city deferred compensation program, the 401A for unclassified employees, the 43B for the Board of Education employees, and the 457 for all employees and administer all pension benefits. The organization chart that you see in front of you consists of staff that are part of the general fund budget. The city treasurer, assistant city treasurer, custody of funds, financial system manager, senior project manager, principal administrative assist analyst, senior administrative assistant, and administrative clerk. On the executive office is the chief administrator officer, and then the investment is the seizure project manager. The office, my office is pretty much strongly diverse. I believe in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, the residency, we have five people that live in Hartford, including myself, nine non city of Hartford. In the race, we broke it down to four Hispanics, two African American, three West Indian, three Caucasian, one Asian, and one Turkish. 64.3% are female, and 35.7% are male. Our recommended general fund budget 
is 532,905. 14.2% is executive office, 75,667. 2.4% is investment management, that's 12,584. And the majority of it, 83.4%, is the custody of funds, which consists of 444,654. In 2023, the budget was adopted of 553,375. The fiscal year recommended for 2024 is 532,905. There's a reduction uh, due to the reduction of the bank fees. Twenty-two, twenty-three accomplishment. Land invest and manage the city one billion pension fund, while distributing, uh, dispersing ten million of the monthly pension benefit, a hundred and twenty million for the year, to approximately three thousand five hundred retirees and the be beneficiaries. We have more retirees than employees. Successfully maintain oversight of the deferred compensation program on a single platform that um, provide a single oversight structure, reduce costs, improve governance, enhance investment option with a portfolio value of approximately 175 million. I approved and dispersal 10 million of the Hartford Park Trust Fund asset for the fiscal year 2023 for the beautification of the city parks over a period of four years. We enhance online access to the Treasure bilingual website, information services related to uh, added financial literacy and retirement form to the website, partnership with Human Resource Department to move towards electronic email direct deposit at devices, which created approximately 35,000 a year in savings with check production overall. My office provide internship opportunity to Central Connecticut State University and Capital Preparatory Magnus School students. We exercise prudent investment management of the city idle general fund cash and short-term investment vehicles. Year to date, approximately seven million in total interest income has been generated during fiscal year 2023. These additional dollars help to lower the bottom line budget and can be used for pay as you go capital improvement project as the city is not currently issue, issuing bonds. We launched the Good Neighborhood Program with Liberty Bank and CADIC in April 2022 to make home ownership more affordable for Hartford resident, achieving 46 mortgages, 195 pre-qualification across the city of Hartford. Facilitated financial literacy workshop to educate constituents on topic, including understanding their credit score, building credit, and home buying workshops. I, we also work with the Human Resource Department to incorporate content related to financial literacy into the wonderful monthly HRB employee newsletter. In the area of retirement planning, ways to repair credit score, healthcare costs and retirement, and the importance of saving early. We facilitated and was instrumental in securing 1.6 million of funding for the launch of Center for Science, Technology, Engineering, the Arts and Mathematics STEM Investment Collaboration with Hartford Parent University, Hartford's Youth Scholars, the YMCA of Greater Hartford, Legacy Foundation of Hartford, the Children's Museum, and this is to strengthen the STEM-based skill from kindergarten through college for Hartford communities. We also uh, did bond refunding of the city general obligation debt in conjunction with the state of Connecticut and partnership with the city administration to the contract assistant with projected saving of approximately 12 million to the state of Connecticut taxpayers. As a matter of fact, we just finished that today. Implemented e-payables and paymo X technology programs to facilitate, secure, and prompt 
payments to approximately 600 vendors and road, creating a saving on check printing costs. Our 2023 and 24 strategic plan initiative is to continue to work with the city administration to enhance our city parks through the prudent investment of the Hartford Parks Trust Fund asset to generate interest income of 600,000. Also to continue to utilize Pay Mode X program to give the city the ability to pay vendors electronically via Automatic Clearinghouse, ACH, with, the, with an expected rebate of approximately half a million between e-payables and mode X, pay mode X programs. Continue to generate interest income from the city's short-term investment vehicles. Also continue to evaluate economically, uh, economically targeted investment ETI opportunity to facilitate economic development in the city of Hartford. Partner with the City Council President and Liberty Bank to organize a bilingual financial literacy symposium and also manage the City of Hartford Deferred Compensation Plan in a manner that brought in, brought in employees' participation and maintain, maintain best in class governance, investment options, and support services. To continue to support our students so they can learn the real world of financial services experiences. Continue to work with uh, Liberty Bank to increase the community outreach and education so much needed for residents to transition to home ownership. Also partner with Human Resource Department to continue to incorporate financial literacy, pension benefit information to their monthly HRB employee newsletter. Continue to be a strategic partner to the multi-year collaboration of STEM, advancement collaboration aim at strengthening partner engagement, creating a seamless level of mentoring and guidance enhancing career development pipeline for the Hartford underserved children. Partner with the city administration on union negotiation to come up with creative ways to reduce actuarially determined employer contribution call aid act on pension benefits. Work with the city administration also to establish an other post-employee benefit OPEC trust fund for city employees. My office, the city treasurer, continues to save taxpayers dollars while maximizing our ability to generate revenue. Generate approximately 8.1 million in revenue, 7 million in interest income in short term investment vehicles, 500,000 in rebates from e payables and pay mode X programs, 600,000 in interest from the Hartford Park Trust Fund assets. In addition to the revenues above, the city will also be receiving a yearly distribution disbursement of 2.5 million for the next four years from the Hartford Park Trust Fund. I'd like to um, uh, thank the staff that are with me here in the office, our consultant commissioners, our leaders in front of me, for their support and contributions and ideas that they provide, have provided for the last seven months that I've been uh, conducting as a treasurer. Thank you very much. Any other information is on our website. We're very transparent on everything we do. If you can't find it, just let me know. But thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you, Madam Treasurer. Um, I neglected to introduce my colleagues. Uh, on the screen, we have Councilwoman Assistant Majority Leader Marilyn Rossetti, uh, Councilwoman Tiana Hercules. Uh, to my right, I have Councilwoman Shirley Surgeon, Councilman uh, Amilcar Hernandez, uh, our Council President and Co-Chair of the Committee, Mally Rosado, myself, Majority Leader and Co-Chair uh, T.J. Clark, Councilman John Gale, and Councilman uh, Joshua Mitchum. Um, 
Is there a question? Oh, okay. I'll start on the screen. Councilwoman Rossetti. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Treasurer, and to your team. Um, quick question. I don't know if you know the answer to this, but um, can we use, uh, you know, me and my tree canopy, can we use trust fund, a uh, park trust fund dollars for people who would like to plant on private property? Because that's one of our issues as we try to increase our tree canopy that oftentimes it's not just where we can plant them, but people want access to them for their properties. Is that something through you, uh, Mr. Chair, that we could, uh, and Madam Treasurer, could we do that? Thank you. Thank you, um, SSETI. We could, we are working, um, I just have a committee together to uh, explore more the ETI uh, that I mentioned earlier um, to see the possibility of collaborating um, without jeopardizing the funds um, and helping the community. So we, you and I could talk a little bit more with the staff. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, question regarding the Harper Parks Trust Fund. Um, what's our account balance for the trust fund right now? Uh, which one, did we have that today? 23 million, Randy? Yeah. No, 23 million right now. And how do we uh, generate the interest income that we receive since there's now a drawdown? Yes. So where do we get the revenue? Is the revenue, sorry, the interest that we receive, is that from investments in the stock market? From, from the market? investments. Okay. That's correct. Mm -hmm. um, now, can you explain regarding the ADEC, help us understand uh, what the ADEC is and what the actual contribution that the city uh, makes into that. What's the, what's, what's the ADEC for? So we just had um, the actuarial report, a draft, which on Friday we will have the final one that provided that information. Um, and it went down from last year to this year the ADEC. Thank you. So in 2022-23, it was 53.69 million, and it went down to 53.53 million. It's about 157,000 decrease. And then, do you have the breakdown of the contributions? Sorry. Oh, go ahead. You can answer it. I'm going to have uh, Gary answer the other question. Do you have the answer? Thank you. What was the other question? I'm sorry. You didn't hear. Um, yeah, I, I was going to say, I don't have the specifics as far as how it breaks down, but it's basically the calculation by the actuaries that's done and reviewed by the Pension Commission every year. Um, and it's based basically to, to pay employee benefits that are earned uh, and that are projected to be earned over the life of each employee. And then it's calculated uh, for each uh, bargaining unit and for, uh, well, and for other you know, and non-union um, employees in that uh, calculation is rolled up into the city's contribution. And we pay the pension benefits three ways. Through the ADEC? Three, one is through the ADEC, okay. the employer, the employee contributions, which is set up negotiation, and then the returns that we get from the funds. Okay. That's so how we pay the pension obligations. <clears throat> so the ADEC essentially is the city's portion out of the general fund that's sent over to your office so you can take care of the all the good stuff uh, regarding the MRF that is the responsibility of the treasurer's office. Yeah, we provide the data information to the actuarial. They come up with a report based on the information we provide them, and they come out with the ADAC as to what the city is supposed to pay. And all depends on the, you know, the pension contracts, how we negotiate the contracts, the pension benefits, 
is how that's going to determine if the liability is going to, it's a little bit of a different factor, but that's the key one. The pension, co the contracts and the pension benefits is how, how you negotiate that is going to play a critical role in the ADUCT. So, if so you could get, we will be happy to give you the final val valuation report that is going to be reviewed on Friday um, at our pension commission meeting. We'll give you the final one after the, the meeting, if you want. And it's always posted on our website. We posted it after a couple weeks. Okay. Um, the Thank you for the information. The um, I just saw it. You mentioned the fact that we have more retirees than we do city employees. We do. <clears throat> so how? We have 2,000 plus employees and 3,500 retirees. And the pensions of our retirees continues to grow. So how does that affect well, our? Well, I mean, the, you know, as they, <clears throat> the numbers. How does that affect the, our overall uh, performance in our, in our MRF? I guess I would say it's indirect, but it does affect it. The, uh, the approach we have because, to, you know, we mentioned the ADEC, which is 50 some odd thousand, uh, I'm sorry, million for the city. Um, the, the employees put in a share as well, but that is still uh, about $50 million short every year of what gets paid out. So um, the, you know, so the pension fund is in a net payout position, which of course is natural for a, a mature fund. It's a very mature fund. Um, but the, uh, the uh, issue is to, you know, keep, of course, making those payments. Um, but the plan, I guess, is always that uh, we try to keep adequate liquidity among, so, so two parts of that is having cash uh, to some extent, so we keep a cash reserve to make sure that two to three months of pension payroll is, is on hand. So that buffers us to some extent. But it also dampens our returns because, of course, especially since the global financial crisis, cash has paid zero. Uh, that's starting to change, so there may be some, uh, some improvements, I, I would say, for public pension funds going forward. However, the other thing is we try to be very diversified, and one of the main things uh, pension funds try to do is have fixed income investments. Those fixed income investments also, since the global financial crisis, have yielded very low historic by historical uh, uh, reference a very low yield so I guess what I would say is trying to maintain a stable uh, liquid cash flowing fund and be relatively conservative you know has been a tough uh, tougher exercise because uh, because of the fact that we do have to try to reduce volatility because we are liquidating investments periodically to pay out benefits in addition, we have benchmarks that we have to uh, address, and we have the MRF benchmark. Over the last three, five years, we have beaten the benchmark. Over the past year, the MRF has performed 68% of similar public funds. We, uh, we could go even higher in returns, but that would involve taking even more risk that we believe is, is appropriate, if it's appropriate. Our goal is to make sure that we never miss a pension payment for our retirees, which is currently about $10 million each and every month. We will never chase the highest return if it means taking too much risk. Our goal is making sure that retirees get paid without risking their, pain, their lives. Thank you for that. So how do you assess that level of risk and how high you may want to look at a different type of investment portfolio to get a yield a greater return? Uh, generally, uh, you know, per the industry, we're looking at what they call standard deviation, which is really volatility of the return. So over time, and, and it has to be done really over time, we're looking at uh, hopefully trying to, you know, lose, you know, what should have more, have a, a tighter range of outcomes, uh, as opposed to having the fund go very, you know, far up in good years and then lose it all in other years. 
obviously you can only do what the market allows you to do. We're, as I mentioned before, and Treasurer Sierra mentioned, we're, we're somewhat risk averse, but part of that is being diversified. Diversification works sometimes better than others. This past year has been a bad year for it, quite honestly. But it's still, over the long term, the approach we find uh, you know, dampens this volatility. And, and the problem with volatility, uh, uh, you know, for the city's sake, budgeting, you know, if, you, if there are significant increases and decreases from year to year in the pension contribution, obviously the uh, city is more challenged in having to try to, you know, make up m a bigger contribution in, in bad years, if you will. Um, but uh, there's other, you know, there's other factors because as we mentioned, we are liquidating investments periodically to pay benefits. Mm -hmm. Um, so while the general trend, thankfully, in markets has been up and we generally are investing in things that generate income, um, we do have to sell investments. So every time you sell investments, you, if you are in a, a loss position, you're locking in losses that you don't get the benefit of those funds in the future. So, you know, there's a compounding effect, I guess you would say. So in any event, I think the idea is we, we measure volatility as our what? risk, but obviously the, no, the biggest risk is when we lose, you know, you want volatility on the good side is good, and we generally have done that. You know, we de generally had, you know, upside, what you would say, upside volatility. Uh, that's okay because that's when you earn a little bit more. Um, but there's also downside volatility. That's what we try to avoid. And we try to lose less in down markets. And over time, that preserves value, which then can be com compounded. So I don't know if that is an adequate answer, but I'd be glad to uh, try to explain it better if, 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 if you need, need me to. No, that's, that, that's good. I have one more. It's a two-part question, then I'll give, kick it off to my colleagues. Can you <clears throat> explain what, uh, what constitute a uh, pension li liability? A pension liability? Yeah. Um, well, and I'm, I was gonna say, I, I, I know a little bit more about actuarial uh, science than I want to, <laughs> but, uh, and I think we all do. I think I'm speaking on behalf of the whole group. Um, but, you know, the liabilities there, are, so it's, it's, I think what's important, and I know, you know, when we think about it, it's, what's important is the liability is composed of, of basically everyone's pension, right? Uh, so we have people who are getting paid now who are, you know, retirees, and there's a projection out into the future of what they will continue to get paid uh, for their expected life. And then there are people who have just started working who are being, who, you know, and, and as soon as they start, there's basically a, a liability much smaller um, because there's a projection out as to how their career will go and what benefits they'll ultimately earn. So those are the, the fundamental computations that go into the, the pension liability. And so basically it's a, a number of individual liabilities all wrapped up into a big number. So that number over time, some of it isn't, as we were saying, unfortunately, or, or fortunately, it's part of a plan, pension plan design and the nature of a pension plan. A number of people are retired now. Those people, that liability is is more uh, pressing, if you will, because it's it's started to to need to be paid, and it is being paid. Um, but the there are other parts of the pension liability that aren't really due to be paid for a while into the future. So that's why basically the ADEC is set up over time to retire all those pension benefits or to pay all those pension benefits off off into. Uh, if you will, perpetuity. Uh, but that, you know, that relies on, as Treasurer Sierra mentioned, having a reasonable benefit structure and also having, as the city does, which is best practice, to make the actuarially determined uh, employ employer contribution every year, which is the ADEC. And if that's done and the assets are invested prudently, consistent with that plan, m you know, the, the uh, investment, what the, investment income and the uh, corpus of the trust will pay the benefits as they become due, which is the liability. So that's why the assets in most plans are lower than the liability because there's, you know, it's like your mortgage. You know, you don't pay it all today. You make the payments you're supposed to pay and ultimately it's, it's liquidated. That's <coughs> why, that's why um, Majority Leader, it's important when the administration does discuss 
who negotiate the contracts, that we have an opportunity as treasurer to analyze the pension component to give you our perspective how the, that the increase the liability or will. And I give you a good example. Police department, which we care a lot, you could easily, you could have a salary of 80,000 and your overtime is 100,000. That's 180 right there. Easily you could have a pension six to 7,000 a month just on overtime, and I know that they've done, the administration's done good work in it, controlling it, but that's an area that needs to still be looked at. Um, but it does, it's an area that does affect the liability. And every contract is done, has different benefits, well benefits, but the way it's calculated and was taken in consideration, even the multiplier and all that stuff, makes a big difference as to how, by the time the person retire, what's that gonna be and how much we have to have money available to pay. So we still need to come to the table and discuss these issues in more details. Thank you. With the, my last question, with, the, with your definition of the pension liability, what, how is it crafted that we can calculate whether our um, pension fund is uh, fully funded? How do you classify that? Well, as you say, well, fully funded technically would be 100% funded that you know is not something that you see as much uh, these days as you used to because the uh, expected return on assets has declined uh, quite significantly over the past two decades um, but I, I guess what we think of it as is that as the city does if the pension contribution is being made every year the the plan is being properly funded I guess is a, a you know, so I, I guess there's a distinction there. You know, the, the goal would be to be 100% funded, that would be great. But obviously that would require a very significant, you know, increase in funding on an annualized basis. And that, you know, for, for most folks is not uh, an option. Okay. And uh, again, the act, through you, the actuarial report, which we will share with you, it says very clearly, even with a funded status of less than 100%, the plan is still in a healthy position with the ability to pay benefit due at the current 68.7% le level. Okay, I'll come back to that because I don't want to monopolize the time. Um, Councilman Her uh, Hernandez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, this question might have been just answered with that last statement, but I, I want to ask it just in case um, it may be something a, a little bit different. Uh, what would be, uh, so does your office have a benchmark of what is considered a healthy um, percentage of the total pension liability? Is there like a benchmark that you always look for that you want to stay above that percentage um, otherwise, you know, you know, it, it may be considered unhealthy to be below that percentage. Is there such a benchmark? Well, well the, the, uh, I guess I would say in terms of what we use as a benchmark, just maybe that is a, a, a better way to explain it, and, and, and you can certainly follow up on that. Um, we, we basically with, work with our consultants and the actuary and uh, come up with a, a combination of asset classes that would generate the return we need uh, to to achieve the uh, actuarial objective and then the uh, consultants do an analysis and, and determine what combination of assets can can do that uh, with the least risk and that combination so like say Simply, we use different, more asset classes than this, but let's say there were only stocks and bonds. We would say, like, say, 55% stocks and 45% bonds. That would be the benchmark that we would use, the return of that. So it's, a, I guess I would say it's a dynamic benchmark in that we, it's not a preset number, but what it is is a combination of the asset classes we invest in and the expected returns that they have over time, and it's over a long period of time, like 10, 10 years. Um, and that 
we track that because so that's that being our ben benchmark we track that if we can exceed that that means we're more likely to accomplish the goal that the actuary has for us to maintain the funding and to pay the benefits and so i don't know if that answers the question not in the sense that I get like a like an actual benchmark, but maybe this just doesn't exist because I'm looking, for example, if I look at your um, um, schedule of the pension liability, um, I, I I see that you know over year obviously changes and and in, in for example in 2022 there was a 120 something million dollars of loss of in investment, uh, which is pretty bad. Uh, it hasn't happened in the last at least eight or nine years. I do know that the market was horrible. Uh, you know, over, you know, COVID period. Um, but even then, um, the question still uh, remains, even with that kind of loss uh, and in any other contributions that you received and any other payments, if you have, for example, a $1.6 billion, um, you know, ending balance, and then you have, so if you have a $1.6 billion pension liability balance, is the city healthy enough to cover that liability over X amount of years or over a period of a year or two? Uh, if something catastrophic were to happen, are we healthy enough to cover that liability? Of course we are. So let me say, Murph paid out $450 million in pension payments, beneficiaries, in access of the contribution that we have received from city and employees. After we pay out the 450 million, the MRF still generated a half a million dollars in value. The net pension liability rose almost 330 million. We have professional staff, consultants, we have the actuarial, and we have our pension commissioner that we all work together to make sure that we do the due diligence to be able to invest smart, safe, and sensible, and at the same time, have the cash to pay out all the retirees that I just mentioned, 3,500 of them, that worked throughout their lives in the city of Hartford. Okay. That's so crucial. Yep, yep. So lastly, just, uh, and I understand that. So lastly, uh, let's say hypothetically that this year we also have a bad year in the market. Um, hopefully not a repeat of 2022 with such a big loss in the market. Um, how, how does your office or the commission treat situations like that to try to um, uh, make some modifications or rectify in order to try to still uh, uh, mitigate the impact of such a loss? Is there such a system or process to try to mitigate that loss? Because it's a loss that you cannot control, it's the market. So is there such a process to figure out, okay, what, what can we do in order to mitigate such a big loss uh, in order to still stay healthy? We are, all, we are, this pension is structured to address all the challenges that we have been facing and still generate fund to pay the obligations of our retirees. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councilwoman Surgeon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, Madam Treasurer. Good evening. And staff. Welcome. You got a printout that was just handed to us. Which and one? I think they gave you, just gave you copies of it. I believe this must have come out of our audit from last year. And I'm looking at um, the net pension percentage of total pension liability. And we've gone from 2014 from 80.79% down to 63.10%. Could you explain over, you know, seven or eight years what has happened? Sure. At the same time, I think the city has been funding 
that year we funded towards um, um, in, uh, city and contribution about 55,000. So since I am not the most knowledgeable person on investment, could you explain what happened between 2014 and 22? say that it's you you'll notice uh, you, hopefully you notice there is that the um, the pension fund itself the net, net asset value stayed about the same but as Treasurer Sierra indicated we've paid out almost a half a billion dollars over that time period so I think on the asset side the MRF is probably going to stay at that billion dollar level that's that's kind of you know it goes up a bit from there and in tough years uh, it may go down a little bit but generally speaking, that's been the level MRF has been at for quite a while. I think uh, what explains the, the change that you indicated is that the liability has increased significantly over that time and continuously and significantly over that time period. Um, and, and while you know, some of that can be tied to you know, benefits that are earned, and that's so just- When you say liability, again, I'm oh. very, so could you just lay layman's term for me? When you talk about the liability is oh, increased. Okay. Yeah, well, that's what will be owed to all the, the employees when right. they collect their, you know, ultimately collect their full pension benefit. That's that 120 end. that we're funding, the 120 million. Yes, yes, yes. So, um, so part of the in significant increase in the liability is, is over that time period. And of course, as we all probably know, since 2008, interest rates got very low and you know, cash is paying almost, has been paying almost zero. So basically what's happened is that everyone's expected rate of return has decreased, and it's part of the mechanics of how pension funds work, but as the uh, expected rate of return decreases, even by a point or two, and this is potentially more than two points, uh, two percentage uh, points, there's a impact on the liability in that it increases by a significant percentage. So unfortunately, this period of time where interest rates have been very low and inflation has been very low actually makes the liability bigger. So I, I don't want to say it because nobody really seems to like inflation and nobody likes high interest rates, but pension funds That's tend better. to do better in times where interest rates are higher. higher. So we hope, you know, mm -hmm. and again, this is not a prediction, but we hope that that will get to be a better situation as we go forward. Now, is that also um, the contribution of there's more uh, retirees to the number of actually city employees who are contributing uh, to the pension fund? That, is, that could be one of the causes. I mean, you have like about 3,500 retirees here, benefits, and we're mm -hmm. about what, to about 2,000? So we have more retirees, more than we have active city employees. Well, yes, correct. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm yeah, just trying I mean, to understand. Yeah, I think this. it's part of it, um, but it's it's. I guess I would say it's it's hard sometimes to spe specifically identify it because basically um, the you know the liability is projected by the actuaries every year. We evaluate. We work with them to evaluate the liability, and the liability kind of changes a bit. But you're right. The having more retired people gives us a little less, less flexibility in that, you know, we're paying, um, you know, purely paying out. We're not getting any contributions towards their pension um, plan. So less employees, um, the interest rates being low, so less money on your return, and you're paying out more. Yes, yes. Yeah, well then. And, uh, and then <coughs> the city is also contributing more because when I look at this, um, you know, we are contributing every year, we are contributing more from our general funds to the pension fund. Mm -hmm. So is that make, not making up the difference? Yeah. No, that, that, those are all, you know, correct obligation, uh, 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 you know, um, observations, but that's what happens. Unfortunately, as the liability gets bigger, that's the basic fundamental, you know, if you will, part of the contribution. Yeah, Madam, <clears throat> the MRF paid out in 12 months, period, about 118 million 
over the past 10 years, we paid out more than 1.1 billion in benefits. 1.1 billion? In benefits. Over how many years? 10 years. 10 years? Mm -hmm. And and again, the hook and hook em made it clear that we are in good health position to pay for these benefits. By about as I long think as also we continue getting the city ADAC payment. Of, and so this year, I think there was an increase again in the city's contribution from the general funds. Um, looking at the budget on page you're 4. Talking about 2. The, ADAC? the ADAC went down. I, it looks like it on page 4.2 of the budget book. I don't have that. How do we go down? So this 24 <clears throat> MRF contribution is about 45.9 million. What page? Uh, page 4.2. 40. Budget book 4.2. Okay. 4-2. 4-2. So last year, I think we funded of the general funds about 55 million for fiscal year 22. I haven't seen 20. So looking at um, the contribution, the 24, you know, 2024 MERF, co MERF contribution of about 45 million this year, pursuant to your actuarial uh, request, that's what we are, what's up, is that what they're requesting we need to fund from our general funds this year? The 22-23 was 53.69 million. 2324 is 53.53 .53 million and went down on the contributions. Just a little bit. Yeah, 157,000 so. Yep. And then Thank you so very much for this education. I'm learning. You're welcome. This is good. All right. You're so we'll make sure you get the actual report. Oh, all of you. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to say I'm going to not going to say I'm going to look forward to reading it. <laughs> I probably be on the telephone every other five minutes. What does this mean? What does that mean? Um, so on this little handout, also, could you explain to me about the um, the other post-employment benefit trust fund? How does that work? And I see that in 22. There's only a 96% liability, which is a little bit better than 21. So I'm just trying to look for an explanation. So did we do it better in the trust one? Yeah. Well, trying to understand. Are you talking about the, the city's or? trust fund, OPEB? Yes. Oh, okay. So there are actually are two OPEBs that we work with. Uh, one is uh, for the Board of Ed, and the other is for the city. Right. Um, so yeah, the city is not, it, or is only partially funded. Uh, so that has a significant amount of potential uh, funding to go to get that to where it can fund. And what it's intended to do, it's, it's basically, um, apart from pensions, employers, including the city, have made certain health care um, or health insurance or health care um, promises to uh, employees once they retire. Um, so in the past, most uh, municipalities in, in state entities, whatever, haven't funded those benefits in advance. And uh, recently, uh, the governmental accounting standard boards has, has basically made um, towns, cities, states report on this. Mm. And uh, so, so this is something that sometimes seems new to people. But in any event, it's, 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 been, it's a liability that's been around. And it, 
in, in what is in potentially intended is if a trust fund is set up and money is put in to fund it, those, uh, those assets can ultimately help retire or pay those benefits when they become due. My understanding is this, the city has not funded enough at this point so that I think the city makes uh, pay-as-you-go contributions to pay those benefits uh, for employees that are retired. Um, our office just, I think there is some cash that is invested in like a short-term investment fund that has generated some returns, but it's not enough, uh, you know, that we don't have enough funds there to generate uh, a significant uh, return. But I think that, you know, this is something that the city I know is aware of and budgets for. Um, on the Board of Ed, on the other hand, has put aside money, and that is, I think, over 90% funded. And uh, we do invest that, and we've done, I, I don't want to say fairly well, but it has, you know, had market rate investment returns, and it has grown pretty significantly, and I think they at least, they project it to be fully funded. Oh, for the Board of Ed. Yeah, which is helpful, because certainly the Board of Ed is significant. But we are only 0.96% funded. Back I'm in sorry. 22. I'm sorry, I didn't. I think we are about 0.96% um, funded. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think well, they we somebody gave me a copy of this report. <clears throat> I'm not sure what that was referring to. I'm sorry? I don't have that information. We don't have that information to discuss. Oh, I thought we had given everyone copies of it. Yeah. There were two. There's just like, as far as we know, just like, you know, maybe almost $200,000 that are invested against the liability that I think goes into the millions? Uh, come again? I'm sorry, I didn't. Oh. Uh, for the city's um, OPEP, I think there is, there is some funds, like 200, but they're in the hundreds of thousands that we have and we invest in STIF and generate uh, you know, a, a somewhat of a return on. But uh, the liability, I think, is in the, maybe even more than the tens of millions. So what the city is doing is paying those benefits each year as they come due. But at some point it would, you know, to have an OPEP trust fund that would actually help them, help the city as an, as an entity, they would have to pre-fund, just like they do, if you will, with pension funds, put away money that would actually grow the trust. And so we are not putting away money every year as we do with right. the Murph, we're yes. not. That's my understanding, that it's not being done. Okay. That's why we need to work with the city administration. To I'm sorry, ma'am? That's why we need to work with the city administration. That's one of the initiatives mm -hmm. to uh, establish the OPEP trust fund for, this, for the city employees. Okay. Thank you. Boy. All right. I'm, I'm really going to have to really think about all this tonight. Madam Treasurer, you're good to remember all this stuff. Thank you. Thank you so very much for all that explanation. Listen, we are open to... You could come to our office and we'd be happy to go over the actuarial report, any information that you need regarding the MRF. As you know, you have a pension and you get paid every month, right? We have not missed a beat. That means we have what it takes to pay that yeah. obligation. Yeah. And well, it's, it, this is not an easy process, yeah. but it's a very tight ship here in this office mm -hmm. and we definitely take it very seriously. And like I said, we have a team from staff to consultants, to our commissioners and the actuarial that we work together to make sure that we meet the rate of return and have enough money to pay the uh, retirees and meet our obligations. Well, thank you. Well, should I come back next year? I think I'm going to go to um, pension college. So if you guys set up come classes, we'll happy. come over and visit for classes. So thank you so <laughs> very much. Listen, I'm still learning myself, okay? Thank you, Madam Treasurer. <laughs> this doesn't take, you don't learn this overnight. It's, it takes a while. <laughs> Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilman Mishta. Uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you all for being here after hours and also for the regular hours work that you do every day. Um, I'm just waiting for, for this transaction to end because I, wanna, I want the treasurer's attention. So, Ms. Sierra, you had mentioned wanting wanting to be consulted, for example, about the, the police contract in terms of the pension implications. Yeah. 
are there, I mean, that's, that's news we can use in terms of when contracts come up. Are there other things, you know, other than the, the you know, every so often union contracts, are there other things where you feel like you should, your office should have been consulted and wasn't in terms of the city taking on liabilities, risks, commitments, things like that, things that have come up. I know you haven't been on the job that long, but mm -hmm. that you've observed. Right. Well, I was really referring to all contracts. Um, right. Right, they all get negotiated. Uh, I gave you an example of the police because that came, the first one that came to my mind, and we seem to have a lot of those coming in. <laughs> but I think moving forward, as I mentioned, part of our initiative is to continue working. We have a good relationship with HR. We have a good relationship with the administration. I guess we need to communicate more and to be able to understand a little bit more each role so that we could be at the table when time comes for negotiation and allow you to give you a financial analysis. That's what we're here for. And then take that in consideration as you negotiate the contracts. And that would help us a lot with the ADAC. Got you. Mm -hmm. um, a different question. I kind of wanted to follow up on what Councilman Hernandez had been asking about sort of the the, the benchmark below which there should be cause for alarm, I'll put it that way. He didn't put it that way, but I, I guess, and, and I understand that it's a fluctuating thing based on the, you know, the mix of investments and things like that, but if, like if I'm looking at the, the plan position as a percentage of total liability, right? Like in 2022, that was 63%. In you know, 2018, it was 71, it, it moves around. But is there a number there for that percentage that should be the we don't want to go below this number number again we we follow and i'll let you speak if you want to we follow our benchmark based on our investment policy statement if you want we could look at this information a little bit more detail and really uh, and allow to answer any other additional question you may have because i don't have all this stuff with me fair enough yeah, it, this is not a pressing question. It's just yeah. I was left with that. We'll be curiosity. happy to answer any additional question based on what you gave us. And if you want, you could, you know, email me your question. I'll be happy to answer those. Okay, I have nothing else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Gale. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, referring to that uh, handout that was given to to you. Um, that's the schedule from 2014 to 2022. Uh, I just have a couple of questions uh, about this. Um, in terms of the expenses every year of uh, uh, the pension, I see at the very top there's something called service cost, and then there's another line item for interest. Can you explain what each of those are? Well, I'll do my best. I think this is, you know, we work with the actuaries, so we certainly, uh, you know, learn a little from them, but uh, this is kind of their, you know, their, their terminology. But my understanding is a service cost is the cost in a given year that gets incurred for pension benefits by your working population. So the employees in a given year earn a certain amount of pension benefit that year, and that's the, the cost of that. And then, uh, and, and the, I don't want to try to the, get You mean the cost for the future of what they've earned that year? Exactly, yeah. So, so if you think about it, it's like an accrual of Okay, of so it's what not an actual expense, it's an accrual right, expense right, right. that you're projecting into the future. Right, and that goes into a calculation of what the pension, you know, the, the change in the liability is from year to year and then they basically discount it back and, and determine how much needs to be funded. So it's part and parcel of how that ADEC we've talked about earlier gets, gets calculated, but it's, you know, it's part of building, uh, if you will, the, building the, the, the liability number that then you know, gets, uh, there, there's an evaluation of how best to pay that off in the current year. Like, and you, you know, so like as we've talked about, there are a bunch of con concepts ro rolled up into that pension liability number, but 
this, you know, again, the service cost, cost piece of it is trying to put a price on this year's employee, uh, uh, you know, efforts, if you will, their, their, their you know, the, the, um, what they're accruing uh, towards their benefit. And then the interest cost, as far as I understand it, is the cost of financing that. So it's in financing the liability. Okay, got it. So these are not ongoing expenses. These are just projections yeah, for right. what we're going yeah, to trying to anticipate what the, you need yeah. to infinity for everybody who's worked this year. Right. They they affect the current number, but it's more you know they're they're not paid in the current year, to my knowledge. But this is your slide. Actually. Okay, so. Okay. And you mentioned that the the. Fund, the total fund balance has been about a billion dollars over this period of time. Now I see the chart mm -hmm. shows it at a billion in 2014 and just at a billion in 2022. So um, during that, um, what is that, a nine year period, it, it really hasn't changed much. Um, and I understand that every year as the treasurer mentioned, we've got to pay out approximately 120 million this year. So we've got a $120 million liability that has to go out. And the components of that, as I understand it, looking at this schedule are 55 million comes from the city and 15 million comes from the employees. So that's a total of 70 million out of 120. So the difference there, that $50 million difference has to come from the fund. Do I have that right? That's yeah. correct. Yes, that's right. So if the fund earns $50 million in a year, um, then we've, we've made all of our, we've, we've covered everything, but we haven't grown the fund one penny. Well, yeah, I was gonna say that, that over time, it has been more or less at the same value for, for as long as I've been here quite honestly and I think Mr. Antoine next to me has been here a little longer and he probably has seen the same thing. No, I'm not asking you whether it's grown. I'm just asking you if my 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 thesis is correct that if we if we if the fund just generates the 50 million that we need to cover the 120 million dollars worth of liability, the fund is not growing at all. We're we're that's right. we're using every single dollar that we earn. Yes. That, yeah, that's correct. So, so in some ways, the way we look at it is we really need to yield, yield also, right? Because we, the income or whatever we generate is made up of income, which, you know, some of which is um, interest and dividends, which is, you know, cash, if you will, that we can use to pay a, a liability. The rest would be a capital gain that we would have to uh, recognize by selling assets. But you're absolutely right, the 50 million, the five, or roughly 5% has been kind of the bogey for where we are kind of cash flow neutral, if you will. So I will give you but the But that percent. interest and that service expense is going up every year, and well, so we're constantly falling behind if we don't generate more in a year then either through the city's contribution the employee's contribution or the or the earnings if we don't generate more than the cash flow we need for that year we're going to fall behind over time no so i'm going to give you a good example from 2014 as, as of 2022 all these years pension payouts alone 984 million 899 our MRF ending value was over a billion twenty. The growth was 50, 50 million to 23. The pension payment contribution was 451,983 million. The value of the MRF generated half a million, 206. So we have, throughout these years, again, hadn't been able to meet our obligation. Madam Treasurer, I get that, but but I'm I'm looking at the bottom line here, uh, uh, on this chart that's showing that the the uh, imbalance in 2014 was 252 million, and the imbalance uh, in 2022 is almost 600 million. So this is this just strikes me as not a good trend.
I'm sorry, go ahead. I, no, would you, I, I would had the you wrong, agree that that's not I a had good the trend? Wrong, no, I, I have two. I had one form, and he's just showing me this form. I, so I'm, I'm sorry. Let's, we're looking at the about. we're looking at the handout that that has nine years. Uh, it's uh, entitled City of Hartford Schedule of Changes in Net Pension Liability and Related Ratios, and it goes from 2014 to 2022. And it shows your liability. It shows your uh, 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 expenses per year, and it gives the net fund balance at the end of each year and it gives the net fund liability and the difference between those is summed up uh, just above a double line uh, about the middle of the page if you see where I'm looking. And that, that is showing that in 2014 our um, net deficit, if you will, I don't know if that's a proper term to use here, but we were out of balance by 250 million and in 2022, we're out of balance by 600 million. And I just, it just strikes me that that's not a good trend and that um, we're, we're to some of the other questions that have been raised here, at some point we're gonna have to do something a little differently. Either the market has to turn around dramatically in the next couple of years and, and make that up or we're gonna have to start making larger pension contributions or employees are gonna have to start paying more for the pension or we'll negotiate the contract better to okay. reduce the liability. Because that's the biggest problem right now. It can come, from, right one of, it can come from one of these three areas. Absolutely. Okay. But the liability continues to grow based on contract, con contract negotiations. All so, right, thank you very much. Thank you. Just one last question. Um, on that same document where it says total pension liability ending $1.6 million. How much of out of that 1.6 million is the uh, was the, for 2022 was the pension um, uh, pension fund um, pension yes pension fund funded? Which one? Under 2022, if you jot down to pension total pension liability ending. Where it says one, one million six hundred sixteen thousand four hundred eighty-one dollars. What was the percent of the, what percent of the pension fund was funded? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. What percent of the? Is that because it says sixty-three point ten percent? I just want to know if that's the actual percentage that the pension fund was funded. You see the, you, you see the space for the category? Can you, can you repeat the question? Okay. I'm having Please. trouble hearing you. Under 2022, the category 2022, on the left hand side, you see total pension liability ended. Ending, 1.6 and change. And jot down where it says plan fiduciary net position as a percentage of the total pension liability. It says 63.10%. Does that reflect that the pension fund was funded at the 63% 60, level? Is that accurate statement? Well, far as, well, ac sorry, actual depiction? It's it's accurate in that, uh, right, that's the valuation as of that point in time divided by the liabilities. That's not what the actuaries use for uh, some other reasons uh, that we can, you know, they, they smooth and they do some other things. But in any event, that's accurate at that point in time, yes. Okay, at that point in time. So as my colleagues were talking about benchmarks, how do we level what's a healthy, I know you said 100%, but really how do, excuse me, how do we level what's a healthy funded pension fund? Well, I think the, uh, what would I say? In that we get uh, annual actuarial reviews 
and we adjust our investments based on the latest market, you know, the latest market circumstances. But we're always using long-term assumptions and long-term investment uh, approaches. Um, the idea is that uh, we will adjust and generate, hopefully, increased returns over time. But you know, again, it's kind of a three-legged stool. There's contributions, and the contributions, if they are continually made, as the city has done, if uh, the, the returns are commensurate with the 6.75 that we had talked about before, and um, if the benefits may, you know, remain reasonable and manageable, this, you know, this will hopefully be a lower ebb because you know, these, the, these, um, these actions, you know, these, these components will work over time to make sure that everybody's getting paid. The, you know, the problem would become if the city were to say not make the pension contributions, the, which has happened in other Connecticut cities and it's certainly happened at the state level. Those tend to be a cause for alarm because you, that's, that's a, you know, a potentially big loss in opportunity cost, et cetera. Um, the, you know, obviously if you're participating in markets, you're going to have bad years just like 2021 was one of the best years we've ever had. Uh, those, those tend to be, you know, part of just noise. So the, this number, you know, we we're talking about volatility. When you measure the assets against the liability just on one day, that tends to um, add some noise to this, which is why actuarials, actuaries use smoothing techniques, et cetera. But in any event, the, you know, the MRF assets are, are up somewhat uh, over this time because if you invest in bad markets and through bad markets, chances are markets get better and you participate. In, you know, and again, that's kind of a longer term perspective and that's what we have to have because our liabilities are long term. So, so that's why, I mean, I think, you, you know, folks had mentioned, you know, is it alarming? It's not alarming, it's just a matter of we, ha we know we have the process, as Treasurer Sierra mentioned, to work through this and, and that it's designed for this. Uh, you know, pension funds are designed to pay benefits. And, you know, it's, it's a tough business. It's been tougher since 2008, but uh, it's, it's a manageable business. People have done it, and we will do it. And we, the city, has has actually done it. I think better than most. Majority Leader, um, again, this evaluation from Hooker and Hookham is critical because it assesses the health of the plan overall, and the data that they get from us, from uh, retirees to death to terminations, you name it, everything and anything, all the data comes from our office that they used to create this report. And even though they talked about the actuarial 68.70 and the current value is 63.50, which is what you see, I go back to what they say overall. Even with a funded less than 100%, the plan is still healthy to meet the obligation of our of responsibility. Thank you, Madam Treasurer. Mm -hmm. um, my last question. In the General Assembly, uh, anytime that there's a financial component to a bill, they send it to uh, the Office of Financial Analysis for a fiscal note. And you mentioned a few times about part of the problem is regarding benefits. Um, that's part of the, the benefits contribution that adds to the A deck. Would it be safe when there's a negotiation, safe to say when there's a negotiation uh, that the treasurer's office should be included to provide a fiscal note uh, so that it can weigh in to say whether this contract negotiation that includes benefits is, um, is in line with the budget or they need to renegotiate based upon the market share costs and everything to make sure that we have more of a healthier pension, then that way it can decrease the ADEC? We, yes, we are required to provide the service of providing a financial analysis of the, append of the contracts before, gives you an opportunity before uh, you negotiate to see how that's gonna impact the ADEC. 
Absolutely. So your office currently does that? No, we don't. No, you don't. Okay, no. that's what you're saying. You don't. We don't. I say we. That's okay. one of my initiatives to make sure that we incorporate that process with the administration to be helpful. You know, we we do the the analysis. It's up to you, <laughs> the administration, to use us to the best they want to negotiate. Okay, thank you. That will help the ADA a lot. Great, thank you. All right, Council President. Hello, Treasurer, and thank you for um, all of you for being here presenting today. So we won't see the the uh, to total pension liability for 2023. We, will you get an estimate like mid-year or where we're at right now? Um, in, I know you'll get the report in 2024. Do you at the middle of the year get an estimate of where we're at? My concern is it's at 63.10%. Six, what happens when it reaches 50, 50%, 49%? When that liability reaches that, what do we have in place? If we can, Is there something that we're going to be proactive? Again, if we negotiate our contracts and have everybody contribute and we do our part as we've been doing, we will be able to meet the obligations. And again, the evaluation said that even though we are 68.7, um, we are in a healthy position. So, and bear with me here. So let's say that based on how it's been trending down, right? So in 2021, it was 74%. 2022, um, it decreased by more than 10%. Let's say right now we were in a 50% 50 50 rate. Would we then wait to try to negotiate a contract? Or is there a certain percentage that you say, wait a minute, you know, we need to visit this contract and try to negotiate it right now? Well, and, there's a lot of, yeah, Madam President, there's a lot of components, like I mentioned, right? The, mm -hmm. the whole contract, the process that we have, the due diligence that we do, the diversification of our pension, of our portfolio, all of those in combinations, we will continue to the best of our ability to make sure that we don't even get to that point. Okay. Just like we didn't get to the bankruptcy of the city of Hartford. Why? because we all work together as leaders to make sure that we do the best for the city. And I think that we have a good administration, we have leaders like yourself, and from our part, we'll do whatever we can uh, to help you learn or understand what we do as well and any ideas you might have to move forward, um, making sure we take care of our retirees and employees. So yes, we'll never get there, as long as I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Surgeon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, what's one last question, um, Madam Treasurer? Is there a total cost for all for organizations or company to help us with all these investments? We have uh, we have the best so far uh, consultants, NEPC and Makita. And who, who, is, is who, there? Um, they've been with us for years and um, worked very closely with the commissioners and my staff, um, making sure we got the best investment managers and diverse. So for fiscal year, how much does it really cost the treasurer's office, you know, for outside investment or help with investment? Do is there a cost? Do you know how much that would be? 300,000. About 300,000 every year? Yep. And that is um, pension commission pays for that, not the general funds. Yes, I know that comes out of the um, yep. pension commission. I know it doesn't go in yep. general fund. And so <clears> we would never really see that pension. in our budget book because yeah. it's, um, yep. so it's about 300,000 every year. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Any other questions from my colleagues? All right, seeing none, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your time and your presentation and uh, answering these questions. You all have a good evening and thank you for your service. Thank you, and again, any additional question, please email them to us. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Madam Treasurer. All right, we will stay in the recess for about seven minutes.
decade. <laughs> this is decade. So, <laughs> as a, as an old woman, you know, come on. Give was me a I? Break. Was it that loud, Haley? Okay, we are back and we have our uh, next department, which is the office of the town and city clerk, which also covers the uh, office of vital records. And we have our uh, town and city clerk, clerk, Mr. Noel McGregor Jr. So you may take it away, Mr. Clerk. Good evening, council members. Thank you for this opportunity to come before you on this budget process that we may explain and uh, what we've been doing, what we plan to do, and, and answer any questions that you have concerning the budget of the Office of Town and City Clerk. I'd like to take the time to introduce my staff that's here with me today, Deputy Town Clerk Eric Lusa, Administrative Assistant Haley Green Lispier, our Vital Records Supervisor Terea Williams. Yeah, we can't hear you too well. I think you just got to work close to the mic. Yeah, and uh, we have with us Carol Nelson, Kimberly Ashley. Am I missing anybody? Ricardo. Ricardo. Vanessa Miro and Ricardo Soto is here with us also. The mission of the town and city clerk. The town and city clerk office is the official record keeper for the city of Hartford, responsible for recording, maintaining, and certifying land records, including deeds, mortgages, liens, maps, and any other related documents. Vital statistics, which is, consists of births, marriage, civil unions, and death. And, secretary of the, and we're secretary of the city council, keepers of minutes and agendas of boards and commission and other town records to ensure transparency, of council agendas and enhanced civic engagement. The town clerk's office is one of the neutrality and impartiality, rendering equal service to all with an emphasis on providing information according to applicable state and local laws, accurately, efficiently, and cost effectively in a timely and courteous manner. The mayor and the city clerk shall engage in outreach efforts, including but not limited to the following in order to solicit candidates for positions of boards and commission, political, religious, community-based, social, mutual benefit organization, civic and business organization as appropriate. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Deputy Town Clerk Eric Lusa. We'll go through our organization and our uh, good evening, Council. Good evening, Majority Leader. Good evening, Council President and Council colleagues. My name is Eric Lusa. I'm the Deputy Town Clerk for the City of Hartford. Uh, on the screen in front of you, you have the organizational chart representing um, the different silos of our divisions. On the left-hand side, you have the operation silo, which is responsible for uh, land records, aircraft registration, dog licenses, mortgages, deeds, and stuff of that nature. Uh, City Council as well, uh, hence why we're here today. And the third silo is on the right hand side is our vital records division spearheaded by Terraria Williams and her uh, staff. Anything you see in red is currently a vacancy. Um, some of our staff composition is seen on the screen is we have five, we have 10 employees that are with us. Five uh, live in the city, five do not. We have uh, 3.5 persons that are Hispanic, 5.5 that are African American and black one Caucasian, seven, fe seven female, and three male. If you take a look at slide five, you're going to see an 18% increase from fiscal year 23 to 24. The primary driver of this 18.3% uh, increase is a few different items. Uh, one is the unfunded, ma unfunded mandate of um, the early voting that is coming down the pike for the upcoming September primary and November's election. You also have a town committee race in March, and you will also have an April presidential preference, which was just moved by the General Assembly. Um, you have contractual increases, and then you have a new position of deputy town clerk that is before you. Um, if you look at the grant line from 23 to 24, you see a, a large discrepancy of 142,000 to 10,000. 
what that represents is a few, few things. If you look in your budget book at page 34-3, which lays out all of our grants, and you go to the middle of the page under town clerk, about three years ago, the town and city clerk's office uh, was able to secure $750,000 in grants from a uh, organization, Civic, uh, Civic Tech, I'm butchering the acronym, but a uh, great organization, um, they gave us 750,000. We have about $74,000 Delta left in that grant money. That grant money did a lot of things. One of the things is iCompass, which you're all very familiar with. Another thing what it did is purchase all the hybrid equipment you see in front of you at no cost to the city or the residents. And going back to that uh, page 34-3, there is a line item for $104,000. What that is, is every town clerk in the state of Connecticut, um, off of every transaction, siphons off a few dollars for internal um, upgrades from computers, uh, part-time workers, um, systems. So we have about $104,000 in that account. Every deed uh, is about $60 for the first page. Some of those funds get siphoned off into a separate account where local town clerks can do what they want without uh, oversight of first selectmen, mayors, and um, authorities of that nature. Uh, one more thing on the grants. We are actually working with our funder from 2020 uh, next week with Joe Young, who is in the audience, and various other uh, partners, the Harper Public Library, this body, to try to secure more funds for the upcoming election as well to try to help uh, increase voter engagement. If you take a look at slide six, your first line here, this is the total revenues for the city of Hartford, town clerk's office, uh, up until yesterday. The biggest driver for this is going to be your conveyance tax. Every time a property transfers in the city, um, there is a conveyance tax paid on those, on those uh, properties. And that is our biggest revenue driver. We, we take a lot of funds in and we disperse a lot of them back to the state. The state will take about 50% of our funds. Year to date, we've collected about $7 million. 3.6 of that, excuse me, 3.2 of that went back to the state of Connecticut. The Delta is ours. The state does collect some fees regarding um, community investment funds, historical preservation funds, MERS and other documents, which is basically the mortgages and deeds that come across our counter. Um, quickly looking at our vital record division, um, uh, transcript of record, it's a little small, you might be able to see it on the screen. Transcript of record is broken out by birth records, marriage licenses, uh, and other uh, vital record copies. Historically, the revenue projection number there is about $800,000. Historically, for the town clerk's office, our projections are about 1.8 million. Um, year to date, we've collected 3.2 million. So, you know, real estate market is still somewhat good in, this, in the city. And you know we're about two million dollars over, um, excuse me, one one point five million dollars over um, projected revenue for this fiscal year through uh, April twenty uh, fifth, which was yesterday. Um, this is a quick snapshot. Uh, the the gist here is a total of six point seven million was collected by our office. Uh, we get to keep three point two million through through yesterday, and we look to hit a four million dollar number. Uh, one quick point I I will make is that we were probably probably pound for pound the most profitable subsidiary um, in the city outside the tax office. Um, you know, our staff costs about eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollars and we usually give back to the city about three million dollars clean. So we are a profitable subsidiary minus the tax office, of course. Development services has about four million dollars in salaries and they'll collect about six million dollars a year in revenue. And I think the clerk is going to go through some of our uh, 2023 highlights. Uh, thank you, Eric. Um, yeah, so our highlights is, you know, we, one of the things that I've stressed is staff development and we've had our staff attend the various training so that we're up to date on all of the procedures, any changes. Um, we were just, uh, several of the staff was at the uh, town clerks association um, conference last week. We've attended the state training through the, the uh, secretary of state and, and other state entities. We've also uh, attended training through the Hartford County Clerks Association and the State of Connecticut Town Clerks Association. Um, we've increased the number of notaries. Um, and we're almost within 100% compliance with that. Um, and of course, we implemented the iCompass software for boards and commission that continues to be one of the major um, innovations of our office and it's been getting great, great reviews across the city. Um, and uh, more and more people are using it. it that increased the transparency and 
and accountability um, and also gives uh, a one-stop shop for all of our meetings. Um, we've also created a Get Out the Vote campaign, Absentee Ballot, where we used a partner with Joe Young, who's in the office, as Eric has said. Joe, will you stand up so everyone can see you, please? Joe Young Studios, um, and he's been very creative. And in front of you, you'll see a folder with two um, English and Spanish um, little comic books. We're trying to get the young folks where they are so that they understand how to do an absentee ballot. We've created, of course, and you'll see some of that as we go through some of our, our um, highlights on, on the screen. Um, so, and we're also continuing to work to, into converting permanent records to digital images, working with Hawk Republic Library. They're supposed to come up and take most of our records that are up on the fourth floor and house them in the Hawk Republic Library and their exhibits there. Um, as you see in slide number nine, um, the, the, the Get Out the Vote campaign, um, we've, well, I'd like to show, let's go through some of the, those slides so that you can get a full feel of what we've been doing. Yeah, so our first slide here um, is our, our voter engagement campaign. Um, Joe Young Studio created the, 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 the campaign with our partner, the Hawker Public Library. And this was, we, we had a successful um, press conference here. Um, where we introduced the community, it was on the media, several of the news organizations, um, Channel was the 8, Channel 61, we in, were interviewed by them and they broadcast it out. We've had um, politicians from other cities want to know if they could utilize BB in their campaigns and we're, and we're trying to figure out the logistics of, of doing that. This was Dennis House on News 8. Um, So we also created a get out the vote. Um, you want to play that one for us? Oh, the PSA, I'm sorry. The PSA first.
um, just as a reminder, you know, all these PSAs, all, all the civic engagement stuff was, was done with grant funds at no cost to the city. And, and this falls under the charter change that was implemented by the Charter Commission, which gives us the authority to reach out to the residents of the city of Hartford to increase civic engagement. Um, voter participation has always been an issue in the major cities within Connecticut, and we're just trying to do our part to increase the voter participation within our own uh, city. Thank you. Um, we didn't stop there. Yes. Uh, uh, through you, uh, Chair, um, what's the name of the gentleman who did that, that PSA? Uh, Joe. No, 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 the actor or. or uh, yeah, the, uh, he's, he'll have a name. What is, who's, what's his name? Okay. Okay. Thank you. His face is familiar. Thank you. Yeah, so um, also we, we did a, a video in front of City Hall. Um, myself and my wife were fortunate to be in part of, uh, in the back there behind Joe, you see the top of her head. And, and, yeah, and we developed a rap song on. So all, these would, all this was done, as Eric said, through grant funds, um, and w we did the charter revision question. Um, we were here at Domingo Go, passing out that information. Also, um, you know, of course, uh, we, we dropped off the comic books to you, so you have them there. They were distributed to some of the businesses, um, and the, the, the Hartford Public Library is one of the places where they're, di they're distributed and Joe has distributed them throughout the, the city of Hartford. Um, and it's in English and Spanish. Yeah, every, everything was done in English and Spanish and we're not gonna take time to play everything, but we do have one more uh, quick slide. We won't play the whole thing, but this was really geared towards um, our boards and commissions PSA, try to drive some voter participation within uh, boards and commissions. Just to, 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 to let you know, this is, we're working on this campaign now. Um, it's not completed. Um, this is part of it. Um, we, we've been working with Joe Young in the library and to, to really get this campaign going. And we're hoping that we will finish it um, by late summer, um, going into the election season in the fall, that we'll have this campaign finished. And as Eric mentioned, we've spoken to the funder. We're gonna meet with them soon. We wanna have all of our, our, our videos and, and public service announcements, everything, a portfolio of them to give to the, to the, the uh, funder and hopefully we'll get some more money. So sh go ahead and play this one. So that gives you an idea of, of us trying to, you know, cut through some of the noise and, you know, it, when you work with this body, you kind of see the same couple names come through for these boards and commissions um, every so often. And we're just looking to tap into a different, uh, a, a different avenue and a different uh, resource within our own populace. Now getting back to some of the basic stuff. All right, before we go on, uh, just to, to let you know what we're, we've been doing so far is we, we s requested audience with all of the NRZs. We've met with four of them, plus Harford Next, to describe what we're doing, to solicit partnerships in, 
and getting the word out to the community about the importance of boards and commissions. Um, we're waiting to hear back from the other um, NRZs to meet with them also so that we can mo start moving this program forward. Um, we, we're trying to plan a summit of some type that to use the grant funds to invite the community. Uh, we're thinking about using the Yargo Stadium and having a big summit of community-based organizations and NRZs to spread the word about the boards and commissions. And as we said earlier, um, the charter, change in the charter um, mandates that the, the clerk's office work with the mayor's office to enhance civic engagement and boards and commissions. So we're working on that diligently as we speak um, and we've been out to the, some of the boards already. And as you can see, the iCompass part, um, you're very much aware of that. The, the iCompass platform is actually the city council's webpage and everything is there so when people pull up city council, they can click on all the meetings, agendas, and it has a bot, box caster which uh, they can watch the videos alongside of the, the agenda. We've also um, included a, uh, a form, a QR code for the hospitals when a newborn baby, a baby is born, they put the flyer with the QR code in there and then they can check with vital records um, to, to get the birth certificate. And then we have other areas of concern, our budget to provide clerical staffing and support service for a court of common counsel, maintain records for all boards and commissions, and we're working diligently on that. It's, it's, uh, it's a process that it is slow because um, a lot of the boards uh, are staffed by, of course, community people who are not that in full time or, or, or responsive. So we're working to get all of those things up to date. We're working with city staff that staff the board to make sure that they're in compliance. Um, so we maintain and prepare Court of Common Council minutes. We do aircraft registration, administrate oath of office, issue dog license, recordings of military discharges, we keep notary justice of peace and municipal campaign financing records, perform a variety of election related duties including the issuance of absentee ballots and preparation of state election reports. We ensure compliance with Freedom of Information Act, issue applicable certificates and permits birth, marriage, and death and adoption, domestic partnership, burials, liquor permits and trade name registration, um, the sale of, support, of sporting licenses, the hunting and fishing, and of course we provide notary service and our new duties that's not on there is community outreach. So we thank you, we have the last. Yeah, I just, we just missed one item on here. And one thing we also do is we, we all the campaign finance for municipal government is filed with our office. And Councilman Gale, back in 2019, I believe you put forward a resolution requiring us to put all those campaign finance on our website. So since that, we did keep everything more transparent and uh, on the up and up. And we'll be happy to take any uh, further questions. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Any questions? Seeing none. <laughs> <laughs> You see, Mr. Clerk, I was trying to get you. <laughs> appreciate it. Appreciate it. <laughs> I was waiting for you to do that, I, Mr. McGuire. I got, know. We've got a lot of energy this evening. I, I Mr. Clerk, I have no questions. I just want to commend you and your staff for bringing the um, town clerk's office to the 21st century. And um, I'm just really happy with what you've done, even with. Uh, Council, so congratulations to you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councilwoman Surgeon. No, Councilman Hernandez he doesn't have any questions. <laughs> it's not so bad. Um, good evening, Mr. Clerk and staff. Yeah, Lovely to evening. see you. In your budget, you apparently, in your budget, I believe the deputy clerk talked about putting in funds for upcoming um, elections or in this fiscal year. You put in funds for primary and I believe the presidential preference primary. Uh, normally 
um, the, normally funds are put in the budgets just for because you have a general election. Uh, I know the, pri the preference primary uh, is a must, but suppose we don't have an election, what, would, what happens to those funds? If we um, our primary, suppose we have a primary, well, what happens we, to those funds? We, we put in a, a, a budget for to cover them. If we don't, it just rolls over to the next election and what we don't use goes back to the general fund. So, so in this recommended budget of the 995, is the election funds in this? Yes, we, we budgeted about $30,000 for election. And then you, how much, I mean, put, is that for both the general, um, this fiscal, next fiscal year, and the presidential and primary? Yes. So the 30,000 for two primaries and one general? Y yes, we're hoping that that would cover it. We didn't want to over budget, but um, sometimes during the primary, if it's not, this one might be a little bit contentious. We may have to hire if it's a higher voter turnout, but we try to stagger the, the help so that we may have one or two people during the primary and then kick up a full staff uh, for the, the general election. So we're, we're not, we're, you know, we're, we're not um, overstaffed for, for those elections. Yeah, so the, the primary driver is $30,000, and, you know, we anticipated a heavy absentee ballot volume in September, not such a high one in November for the actual general election. Um, the town committee races, you know, those don't drive too many AVs, so we don't need too many more temporary staff. We can do that in-house. And the way it looks now with the presidential preference, um, it's a big Democratic city. Biden more than likely won't have a primary challenger, so we don't need to worry about the Republicans. Um, not a big Republican population, so we don't envision any additional manpower needed for those last two. And suppose the, um, but you budget 40, 30,000, I suppose you spend more. What happens? Because um, would it, we, wouldn't it make sense to actually make, because you have to have a general. You do have to have a president preference, but you don't necessarily have a primary. Mm -hmm. And so even though you said, you know, turns over to next year's budget, Normally, the primary funds are put in sundry, and if you need it, mm -hmm. then it's, you know, you put the budget in. So, you already included in this 995? Yes, we included $30,000. We, we anticipate the number of weeks that we would need to have part-time workers. We don't bring them in too soon. You know, the, the, the date for when absentee ballots start going out, is when we first start bringing in staff, and then we gear up as we as it picks up. You you understand that it doesn't pick up right away. It takes time to build up. In the last couple of weeks, it will bring on more staff as we need. So if you go over this thirty thousand budget, you will come back to the. No, we're not. You, no, it, it'll be covered. Yeah, we have some wiggle room with our budget that could cover any unforeseen circumstances. I'm sorry, what was that? We have some wiggle room in our budget that can cover any unforeseen circumstances if we go over. Oh, so in your I mean, I could use the COVID funds from, the, from you know, three years ago to cover some of that cost. You know, when the 2020 election was in this chambers and we had 15 temporary staffs, that's what um, our grant money of the $750,000 got covered. We have $73,000 left over. If, in a worst case scenario, we could tap into those $73,000 to cover any additional costs that may pop up. So you have 73,000 grant funds left over. Yeah, yeah. And that's uh, budget from page 34 dash. Right, and so you said you tap, in case you go over the 30,000, you tap into the grant funds. Correct. Was the grant fund used for payment of payroll or is it yeah, for payroll, outreach? Yeah. As a pay, payroll, um, civic engagement. It, the, the, the initial funder was Facebook. Facebook had an image problem back in 2019, 2020, and they literally gave away $500 million, and we were happy enough to apply and get a small slice of that money. Yeah, the monies from the Facebook grant were used for um, PPEs, uh, the equipment, masks, everything associated with COVID, and for staff, and for bonuses for hazard duty pay. But you still have it said about 70,000 left out of it. Is that the, the COVID is, well, my tenants said COVID yeah. is not over. Yeah, what we did, we went back to the funder and yeah. that's why we're able to do the civic engagement. They allowed us to roll it over for civic engagement to use as we see fit 
um, for anything elect elections and, and, and community engagement. And so looking at your budget of about six million that's generated in your office, and you said about 3.2 million in fact you have to send back to the state? Yes. And so basically your budget in your office is like 995, that's just salary, not including benefits or anything? That's just the salary. I'm sorry? That's the salaries, or however they, they compute that. that <laughs> yes, everything. Everything in the office. But, okay. I gotta look at the line item sheet, which I don't have. I'll take a look at that. So you have seven in operation, five in battle records. And it, I think you said you had two vacancies? Yes. And that is built into the, in the budget? I'm sorry, I didn't hear So you. that's built into the budget, so you're in planning and hiring in this fiscal year? Yes. And that was for, is that vital record or just for operation? Is the admin clerk, so is that would be in the town clerk side, and then one assistant registrar on vital record? Yeah, we're working with um, budget. There, there was a little discrepancy in the slide, and we're working with budget to work out the, the exact um, positions in the office. Because we had some issues with um, where one position was recorded you know, to the other, so it's uh, showing up here. So we're working with budget to, to straighten this out, and we'll get you the updated slide as soon as we meet with budget. Okay, so you don't have a position for project manager? It's still in there, yes. Okay, so, so you have two big. Yeah, we're yeah. working with budget to, 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 to straighten out the, the, the number of positions. Um, as you would see that it says 13 and we had 12 positions. That's why I was trying yes. to, yeah, I'm yeah. saying 12 yeah, here in the slide. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. And so that's wrong in the book and better write in your slide. Yeah. We'll oh. get that to you. Okay. So would that, re so would that reduce your, bu your budget from the 995? It because should. Because you're budgeting for. Well, we work with budget to see what it, what, it, what it does to the budget. Okay. I think that was all my questions. Oh. Is this the best year, last couple of years you've had with a conveyance tax increase like this because of? Um, yeah, yeah, correct. We, we look to see, I mean, we're anticipating a, a, a drop in the next co coming years. Um, you're starting to see some of these um, office buildings, particularly in downtown Hartford, uh, reducing value. Um, COVID has been hitting the uh, class one A office space to a degree where the buildings aren't worth the same value they were um, during this last reval. So th that will be a challenge in, in the later years, but we still anticipate uh, hitting our projected revenue numbers, um, just not beating them by 2x or 3x. Okay. Thank you, Ms. You good, Council? I think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you, know, you got the platform, so. So you, get, you have the floor, so you know. <laughs> you good? Josh, you good? You have any more questions? Just want to commend them on the, um, the definitely, I love the uh, information on the vote the ballot box. That was a really ingenious. If, you know, I think the kids in schools would love that. Uh, and you know, most of um, uh, kids influence their parents in being actively involved. I think if you took that into the schools, you really would get more um, you know, kids and parents involved in voting. Um, because I think there's something the kids would really get turned on about. Yes, thank you, Council. One of our objectives was really to meet the people where they were. You know, even a person with a PhD can understand this. So we made it simple in a format that people can understand, and that's the same thing we'll be doing with the civic engagement on the boards and commissions to make sure that people understand the, the, the grassroots organizations and what it means for politics and what it means to 
to having people participate in their city. Um, so we, we know what needs to be done. You know, we're trying to do it. Um, working with Joe Young and the library have been a tremendous asset to us in doing this, and we want to continue that. And that's why we're going back for funding so that we can do a massive PR campaign um, going forward. And it's something that is, it would, is usable year after year. It nice. doesn't get old. I think you should send the ballot box um, to with the registrar when they go to annually register high school. That would be a really cool um, th thing for them to bring with them. Is there somebody that dresses up or do you have a, a yeah, it, it, makeshift ballot box with somebody all dressed up? It is a person inside that box. Really? Yeah, oh. he has the, the, the as you saw, the, 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 the tights or whatever, the, the, and the sneakers and everything, he has that costume. Uh, the ballot box is in the town clerk's office, in my office as we speak. So okay. you just have to put it on. And he was out during the Domingo Go break dancing. Oh, that's best so, he could, yeah. whatever. Uh, with, with the community, people were taking pictures, and, and he was just out there having a good time. So we hope to be able to have it out at the, the various um, events this summer. Um, and, of course, uh, if Joe Young can make sure that we have the, the, the body in the suit because it wouldn't fit me. <laughs> hey, maybe we can market and send it out to the other towns since they want this so much. Yeah, we're working on that. You know, so can we license that, you yes. know, for Hartford and, you know. We're, working, we're working on that. Remember my background as a businessman? We're going to try to monopolize, monetize it as best we can, put money back in so we can continue to do right. the civic engagement. Yeah. Well, congratulations and congratulations to the team. I think it was great. Job well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. I, d I have questions. Wow. wow. <laughs> and, and we're good You're to trying you guys. to get ready to go. <laughs> um, I, I thought Councilwoman Shirley had all, all the listen, questions. Listen, you don't want to hear me say thank you for your service? <laughs> yes, we love to hear that. Love to hear that. <laughs> Thank you for your service, really. Uh, thank you for your, your leadership and your team that you have built, and you've been a clerk now for four years? Three. Three years. A lot has happened in three years, and thank you for really transforming the office and helping out with council work. And I, I actually want to put this suggestion out there um, that I think that in addition to the person that's in the ballot box, uh, there should be a representative in the ballot box from the clerk's office and also to <clears throat> the ROV's office as well. So we can have a good, <laughs> good, <laughs> good collective team effort. But really, I really thank you very much for your service, uh, not just to us, but to the uh, residents of the city of Hartford. So um, thank you and have a good night. All right, thank All right. you. I, I have a question through you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> he started this. So, so Mr. Clerk, do you guys um, foresee any grants that you will be applying to? to? That are, that are perhaps coming up, and how do you plan on keeping up with, with the budget for the civic engagement in the future years? Okay, so, so that's a good question. Um, last week, um, Eric, Haley, and Terea were at uh, the one of our conferences, the Town Clerk Council uh, Conference, and so happened one of the representatives of the organization, the Civic Techs, civic Techs who we got the grant from was there, so was able to network with him. We'll be meeting with him hopefully next week. We have um, the portfolio that Joe Young is developing to present to them, and hopefully, you know, if they have enough money or it's, it's I, I envision this being a national campaign. Um, ballot box can go out throughout the country. Um, ballot boxes are not just here in Connecticut. But so we want to work with them, and hopefully there'll be enough funding to do a national campaign. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. And again, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That is it. Have a good night.
right here. We have the registrar's office. Ms. Feliciano, you may take it away whenever you're ready. <laughs> we have, uh, we have uh, our last uh, department for the evening, um, the Registrar of Voter Office, and we have uh, the Democratic Registrar, um, Gigi Feliciano, and the Republican Registrar, Vanessa Garay Jackson. Good evening, everyone, uh, council members that are viewing via Facebook, via Access Television. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, first of all, I'd like to start off with uh, introducing to my left, Ms. Vanessa Garay Jackson, the Republican Registrar. Uh, behind me, you will find to my right, Executive Assistant Olga Colon. You have Chabeli Gonzalez, Glory Bill Santiago, and Enrica Velasquez. She's new, she's the deputy. Unfortunately, Ms. Kathy could not make it this evening. We'll start off with the mission, as always. The Registrar of Voters Election Administration, ROV, serves the needs of the voting public and the municipality in which they are elected. ROV is governed by the federal, state, and local laws. ROV works closely with the Office of the Secretary of State to ensure registered Hartford residents exercise their right to vote. Procedures are protected. ROV sacred honors to protect, promote public trust, and confidence that we will conduct a fair and accurate elections to the best of our abilities. It is the requirement that we stay focused on our vision of a free and impartial election despite changes of our society and its laws. Nurturing and protecting democracy is a team effort. Registrars continue to advance with required professional accreditations prescribed by SOTS and current election laws. ROV is bound to uphold the integrity and in performing all duties of our professions. Following is our organizational charts as you see. Residents of voters are the top. Besides me and this, um, Ms. Forget, uh, Vanessa Garay Jackson, the Secretary of State, I've already introduced um, our staff. Move forward. Our staff uh, component are all women in the office, unless it's during the election. We're all Hartford residents. Uh, Ms. Kathy Brooks is our African American, the remaining are Hispanics. Election workers, as you see, um, the 28% are Hartford residents, non Hartford is 5%, and then the race uh, breaks down from there, and that's where we actually have more males. 
our highlights for this uh, 2023. As always, maintaining our voter files, our voter tabulators, preparations um, that are needed by the Secretary of State. We've participated in several community events to promote regist voter registration. Domingo Go, Tuto Cute, Neighborhood Day, Connecticut Community for Addiction Recovery, National Night Out, Capital Prep, We Were Seniors, uh, We Are One, You and I, and Community Fair, and Student Ambassadors at McDonough School. And we also continue to do high school drives as we speak today. For federal requirements, the Registrar of Voters is meeting the needs of the city's diverse citizenry. Via SOTS, we currently use language line solutions in every polling location, which allows the use of multi-language interpreters, which poll workers have um, access to via uh, cell phones that are provided through MHIS. Those are 300 languages there. We also provide uh, training for all our elected officials, as we usually do. We conduct our canvas, uh, voter, our annual canvas cards. For those who have not returned or mail out your canvas cards, please do so. Um, we have processed 4,200 new voters, processed 7,020 voter changes due to deaths, moves, party, and affiliations. We've completed the ERIC report. ERIC report is uh, a company that is uh, you might have heard it through the news, many um, election record intention, and I forgot what the other letter is, and I apologize for that. But what it does is helps all registrars accurately um, deal with our registry list for those people who have moved out of state, have died, and so forth. We'll soon process municipal petitions after the convention this July. Uh, the CVRS system, the Connecticut Voter Registration System through the SOTS will be, is currently being upgraded soon to, I believe, within a couple of months. We're going to be getting an upgrade on the election management system, EMS. Our, our ROV website this year was actually updated with a database that allows anyone to go ahead and check out any election status. Um, so if you go on our current website right now, on right on the right hand corner, it'll say Hartford elections stats, and you can go ahead and click onto any year from 2001, I believe, to current. Um, and you can see everyone's um, election turnout. Our strategic initiatives, um, as we all know, in 2022, Connecticut voters amended the state constitution authorizing early voting. And I'm just paraphrasing to this because I know. Um, we're going to see what happens when session begins and how the changes are going to be made and how our offices will be affected with this. We maintain voter fires and accuracy, complete record retention, maintenance, enrollment, and we repeat the process over again as months go through. So we go through the calendar, which is a constant repeat. So moving on. Strategic initiatives. Our primary date uh, of endorsement is between July 18th through the 25th. Our nomination petition filing are due by August 9th, municipal primary September 12th, early voting October 2023, but that is to be determined. Uh, but those are the dates that we are given by SOTS, but we still have to wait for legislative to move forward. General election November 7th, the town committee in March of 24, presidential preference in April of 24, uh, we'll continue our ROV staff with updates on CVRS, EMS training. Our emergency contingency plan for early voting is in the works. Preparation for election deadlines and changes are for upcoming alerts and procedures. The budget comparison, as you see, are due to the elections that we discuss and also reflect an increase due to contractual wages um, that we have, and that will be it, short and sweet. Any questions? 
Councilman Mitchell. Thank you, thank you, registrars. Uh, really, just a small note, and I'm, I'm not trying to bust chops, but these, um, I, I would want, I would love if you all could provide for us the these the demographic composition charts, the two pie charts. They're um, they're not right. Okay. In the sense that, like, you put too many things that add up to more to 100 in one chart, right? It can't be that you have 28% non-Hartford residents and 5% Hartford residents, then you got a whole other chart, right? Like, you I'll give you a break, a better breakdown yeah, yeah, if you like via email. These because right now this kind of does it, it, it just doesn't work. You feel That's me? perfectly fine. Thank I'll you. do that. No problem. Thank you for your presentation. Okay. <laughs> thank I, you for your service. I just want to commend your staff. Great job. <laughs> and uh, thank you. They told me I couldn't ask any questions. Mm -hmm. Oh. I'm being censored. <laughs> In <an excellent> way. <laughs> no, but I do want to say something, though. Um, in your budget, did you build any, if there is a new um, early voting? Did you build that in your budget or anything or any proposal of what it may cost? No. The reason why I did not <clears throat> build in our plan currently within the office, if early voting continues to be the way it reads under the bill, where it's one central, uh, centralized office, I would like to use the current staff we have. And instead of paying a daily poll worker, I would like to see an increase not only in the staff that does not fall under the contractual OT to be able to finally give them a proper pay raise, but also to avoid having excess training of anyone who does not know CBRS as our staff does. So I'd rather pay the staff we have currently within the office to do it, seeing how we will have to mandate it, we will have to work it. I'd rather see my, my people here in, in the office fluctuate that. So I'm looking to see, and I did put in for PRC for those who are not union to receive a pay raise. Unfortunately, it was not granted. Um, because of the early voting. So I technically did put in a budget, but it was denied. My union folks, which are only two, are contractually getting a percentage uh, come July. But with that being said, they will get the OT for the hours that technically, if it goes through the early voting bill, they will be receiving OT. So it kind of will balance out what they have. Yeah. Um, so basically, because you actually don't know how the process is gonna work as yet, um, and it's gonna do a lot of training, it's gonna be needed. I do understand, because you're gonna probably utilize your current staff to do a lot more of the training. Correct. Uh, you're certainly gonna need a lot more poll workers, election workers, mm -hmm. so utilizing that budget, then you will be able to, your appointed staff, will get the benefits from the actual overtime with the training in the next couple of months for the Correct. November's election. Correct, and the entire staff are certified moderators, so that's one of the requirements. So if I have to ship one of them out to deal with a side uh, early voting location, mm -hmm. then we will, um, I, I, I feel confident that they will be able to handle a spot such as that because my understanding from the bill it's looking more and more like an EDR position than an AB. So when you when the state or finally decide what that process will be is it possible to come back to council and give us an update of what that is going to entail? Unfortunately I'm not lucky as the past department that has monies in their budget I always have to come to you. <laughs> That's so why our monies are sacred in the sundry, and uh, we come. I come to you, or I come. I send a resolution via mayor, and having that. 
that was a surprise to me also that um, primaries are not put into sundry. Yeah. No. Okay. Well, we'll see you in a couple of months because I'm sure you're going to have a very active election year. You will see a resolution, hopefully, uh, be your first July meeting and your only July meeting okay. for the September election. Great. And mm -hmm. thank you, and thank you guys for your service. Thank you. Councilwoman Rossetti. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I had some issues here at home, so I wasn't able to say this to the town clerk's office, but both town clerk and um, the registrar's office, I want to, as I've said to many departments, I want to thank them, but I particularly want us to realize what was accomplished during COVID. Um, certainly everything took more time, more effort. I know in the town clerk's office, I know with the registrar's office. So I just, again, wanted to thank folks for, you know, going over and above during those times, as I know all of us did, but this is an opportunity to say it publicly, so I want to thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, Gigi, thank you for your service and for your staff and for everything that you've done on behalf of the residents, and we should appreciate your hard work. I know it has not been easy, um, and, but uh, again, thank you for your consistency uh, that you have uh, displayed thus far, and uh, you've been a great partner. So Thank you. Please don't hesitate to let us know what we can do for you. No problem. All right? Uh, thank you. Have a good evening. You as well. Now, if I stand up, you're gonna, no one's going to say no other questions. No, you're good. You're good. You're good. Okay. <laughs> thank you. And I, I just want to take a minute to uh, say hi to Jeff. Hi, Jeff. That's you back there, right? Even though I don't have my glasses on. I want to take uh, also the time to say thank you so much. Um, for always being patient. I'm going to sp speak for myself on uh, OMBGA, uh, helping us out through the budget and understanding it, and always um, answering our questions and being very patient with us. So thank you. So this concludes our um, departmental budget hearings, and tomorrow we'll um, conclude our this phase of the uh, budget process. We'll have our final public hearing, which will be virtual, um, tomorrow starting at 6 p.m. Uh, so uh, please contact the town, uh, either the town clerk's office or the council's office uh, for uh, that Zoom information, and that will be sent out to you. Uh, so thank you very much. And public hearing tomorrow? Yes, public hearing tomorrow. Virtual. Virtual. Virtual, virtual broadcasted by HBA TV. Uh, so thank you very much, and this meeting is now adjourned.